Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. This is part two of a two-part episode. If you have not listened to part one, you will want to do that first. A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. The character of Medea in Greek mythology is a controversial figure. She was depicted as a sorceress who helped the man she loved, Jason, the leader of the Argonauts, steal her father's most prized possession, the Golden Fleece. Then, to aid in their escape from her father, Medea killed her brother and chopped him into pieces to distract her father from pursuing them. Medea and Jason lived together for 10 years and had many children. Like all myths, there are many versions of this story, and in the playwright Euripides' version, Jason abandoned Medea to marry King Creon's daughter. Medea is furious. From her perspective, she had given up everything for Jason. Medea would do anything for him. She had even killed her brother and given up her family. But Jason explains to Medea that he must marry the princess to increase his social status and wealth. Medea was too much of a barbarian, he said, but he told her not to worry. He would still keep her as a mistress. Needless to say, those words were not well received. While she pretended to be okay with the situation, Medea plotted her revenge. She sent the princess a wedding gift, the golden robes of the sun god. But those robes were covered in poison. And as soon as the princess put them on, she experienced horrible pain and died. Her father, King Creon, also died after trying to save her. He too came in contact with the robes and suffered a horrible death. But Medea was not done seeking revenge. Angry at the embarrassment and hurt Jason had caused her, she kills their children, only hesitating when she thinks about the pain it might cause her. When Jason rushes in to confront her about the king and his fiance, he finds his children dead. Medea meets him in a chariot given to her by the sun god, and refuses to let Jason hold his children. She takes the bodies with her as she leaves him to mourn his losses alone. Her revenge was now complete. Diane Downs is a lot like Medea. She too is a narcissist, thinking only about her own pain. Diane was also fully committed to one man, a man who had rejected her, a man who she would do anything for, even kill her own children. However, for Diane, it was not revenge. It was a sacrifice. But Diane Downs is not a character in a Greek myth. And she did not get to ride off in a sun god's chariot at the end of her story. Instead, she is trapped in a prison of her own making till the end of her days. Enhance your listening experience with Wondry Plus. Enjoy ad-free listening, exclusive content, binges, and more. Join Wondry Plus in the Wondry app or on Apple Podcasts. 
Bowman was last seen in November of 2021 at a 7-Eleven in Los Angeles. His final text was to 911 for help, help that never came. I'm Marissa Jones, host of The Vanished. My latest episodes cover everything we know about Bo Man's disappearance. Listen to The Vanished on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Diane Downs, part two. In case you need a refresher from last week, on May 19, 1983, Diane Downs and her three children pulled into an emergency room in Springfield, Oregon. Diane and her children Eight-year-old Christy, seven-year-old Cheryl, and three-year-old Danny had been shot. Cheryl had died soon after reaching the hospital, and Christy and Danny were in critical but stable condition. Diane was shot in one of her arms. Her radial bone had been shattered, but other than that, she was okay. Danny was paralyzed by the bullet in his back, and Christy was partially paralyzed on her left side. She drifted in and out of consciousness, and the doctors were not certain if she would ever speak again. Diane told police that they had been attacked by a man who flagged her down in the middle of the road. She stopped and the man asked her for her car. When she refused, he reached inside and shot the children. As Diane escaped, the attacker, described as a shaggy-haired man, shot her in the arm. Police were suspicious of her story. They thought that Diane might be covering up for someone. They canvassed the area around the crime scene and found nothing of note other than two 22 caliber casings stamped with the letter U. They even searched a nearby lake hoping to find the gun, but came up empty. The newspapers and television news outlets were covering the case nonstop, asking for the public's help locating the bushy-haired man that Diane had described. But despite a multitude of tips, the police had no luck finding the killer. But because of Diane's detached behavior at the hospital, the holes in her memory of the attacks, and the effect that her presence seemed to have on her older daughter, Christy's heart rate, which to those watching indicated fear, police began to focus on Diane as a suspect. But they struggled to find a motive. During the investigators' initial search of Diane's apartment, detectives had found her diary and learned of her relationship with Nick. With the attention now on Diane, the detectives, along with Fred Hughey, the district attorney, went back and searched her apartment again. It was there they found a copper cartridge from a 22 caliber gun that was stamped with a U, just like the casings at the crime scene. However, that is not surprising. 
It is a common stamp for those bullets. And without the actual gun, police could not definitively tie the bullets in the cartridge to the casings they found at the scene. Investigators also found a receipt for $21.09 for a brass unicorn statue, the one noticeable decoration in Diane's apartment. It was engraved with the words, Christy, Cheryl, and Danny, I love you, Mom. The statue was dated May 13, 1983, six days before the shooting. The unicorn and the diary were placed prominently in the apartment, almost as if Diane wanted the police to find them. Once again, they found stacks of letters addressed to Nick. Fred Hugie and the detectives knew that interviewing him was essential. Robert, Nick Knickerbocker, lived in Chandler, Arizona, from where Diane had recently moved. He and Diane had been co-workers at the postal office and had an affair. When police interviewed Nick, he told them that the affair had started out as a fling, but Diane soon set her sights on marrying him. Nick told her that he was not interested in marrying her or being a father to her kids. He also told Diane that he was not going to leave his wife. I'm going to assume here that the only thing Diane heard in that conversation had to do with him not wanting kids. After all, what could possibly be wrong with her that Nick didn't want? Diane promised him that she would find a way to make sure the kids did not bother him. Finally, police had a motive. Even though Nick had wanted to keep their relationship secret, Diane had told everyone at the post office where they worked. She had become overbearing, but Nick thought Diane would tire of him and move on, as she had done with her other lovers at the post office. That was not to be, and until Diane left Arizona, Nick could not separate himself from her. Diane tried to drive a rift between him and his wife by telling him she had an STD and Nick was required to tell his wife, forcing him to confess to their affair. But after a brief split, Nick and his wife stayed married, frustrating Diane even more. After her move to Oregon, Diane had flooded him with phone calls and mail. He ignored the phone calls and returned the letters unopened. Nick also surprised police by telling them that Diane had called him the morning after the shooting. This time, Diane called the post office to make certain Nick would take the call. Diane was calm as she told him about the shooting and then said she loved him. Nick was stunned and told her to leave him alone. But he said she just would not take no for an answer. Even with all this information, police were still not sure that Diane was their killer. They could not fathom a mother killing her children. Also, finding the evidence to convict Diane was not easy. The main problem being, there was no gun. Christy was the only eyewitness that could shed light on the case, but she was still unable to talk, and Danny was too young to be of much help. Diane 
took their suspicion in stride. She flirted with half the officers assigned to the case and seemed to taunt the rest of them. As police continued to investigate, Diane would continually bring up her diaries as if she wanted the police to read them. The journals were filled with stories about men finding her attractive and how much Nick loved her and wanted to marry her. Even in her own private thoughts, she could not see or accept the truth. Diane, for her part, would frequently call the detectives to give them her opinions on who committed the crime And she'd run to the papers and complain every time they rejected her suggestions. Her story would change as Diane claimed to remember more details about the crime. She even told police that she remembered the killer saying her name. This would make the shooting a targeted attack. There was always something new almost as if she were playing a game and daring them to arrest her. When investigators brought her in for questioning, Diane was able to give an explanation for anything they asked. The police later wrote in their reports that it was like verbal vomit. As Christy and Danny recovered, there were 24-hour guards around them, Diane was not permitted to see them alone. She claimed that her children were being brainwashed by the prosecution. The police were eager to arrest Diane, but the prosecutor, Fred Hugie, would not allow it. He wanted his case against Diane to be unassailable. Fred had become very attached to the children, and finding and convicting their killer was personal for him. Then investigators got two big breaks. The first came from a motorist who was behind Diane's car the night of the shooting. The motorist told police that Diane was traveling so slowly that he had to drive around her. He claimed that Diane was driving around 10 miles an hour in the direction of the hospital. This means that Diane was not rushing to get her children medical attention. The next break was even bigger. Christy was finally able to talk, and her memories of the night of the shooting had come back to her. Interestingly, the song Hungry Like the Wolf by Duran Duran was the key that sparked her memories. This was Diane's favorite song, and it was playing as Christy and her siblings were shot. After months of rehabilitation and therapy, Christy was finally able to name her attacker, her own mother. And that declaration was all Fred Hugie needed to finally give the go-ahead to arrest Diane. And on February 28, 1984, nine months and one week after the shooting, police finally arrested Diane Downs for the murder of her daughter, Cheryl, and the attempted murder of Danny and Christy. In April of 1980, Diane watched a TV show about surrogate parenting. She wrote to the company featured and offered to be a surrogate, but she had to pass a series of tests. And while Diane did place in the superior intelligence range, she did not do so well when it came to reasoning and concept formation. A psychologist at the clinic found that her weak spots were consistent with a, quote, 
major psychopathology. Part of this came from the information that Diane shared about her childhood abuse, troubled marriage, and her last pregnancy, especially having to choose the father from a plethora of men, once again, oversharing. This alarmed the psychologist, who then administered the MMPI test, which is a personality test consisting of several hundred questions. The doctor was alarmed by what he called Diane's extreme lack of self-worth and difficulty expressing her anger, which Diane had a lot of. He believed she acted in a histrionic manner and felt she was using the surrogacy to escape from her feelings of inadequacy. Diane flunked the psychological part of the testing twice. The second psychiatrist said that she could, quote, shut her emotions down at will, simply shut off her feelings, like flicking a light switch. I couldn't agree more, but don't forget, Diane learned to do that as a little girl because of her father's sex abuse. But here's the thing. Diane Downs is not overtly mentally ill. She does not have a thought disorder, meaning she's not delusional. She's not hearing voices. Nor is there any indication she suffers from bipolar disorder, which can entail uncontrollable and profound mood swings. Both of those diagnoses have been made about other well-known maternal child killers, such as Andrea Yates, who drowned her five children because she suffered from a thought disorder. She thought if she drowned her children, they would go to heaven and be safe from the devil. But all serious mental illnesses have been ruled out as afflicting Diane. So what is Diane's problem? Diane's behavior was front and center for the whole world to see because of the numerous media interviews she gave, including perhaps her most infamous one on the Oprah Winfrey show long after her conviction. The boogeyman shot my children claims would leave even the most novice of diagnosticians to ring the psychopath bell loud and clear when it comes to Diane Downs. But is there more to it than that? Well, the P word, psychopath, is probably the most common clinical diagnosis of cold-blooded killers, even mothers. We all know the images that word conjures up. A person that is evil, repulsive, horrible, and so far beyond bad that normal people cannot even fathom their motives or behavior. We hear the words, he's a psychopath, far more than we hear the words, she's a psychopath. In fact, many people, especially men, believe a woman cannot even be a psychopath, let alone a mass killer. It is true, my gender of psychopaths are less prevalent in the general population than males about one-half of one percent compared to males that are about double that. But I can assure you, and you know it as a fan of killer psyche, female psychopaths are no less dangerous. So why aren't female psychopaths as easy to spot as males? According to Winifred Rule, an expert on female psychopathy and author of Born to Destroy, Females can certainly be psychopaths, but they are, quote, fundamentally different in their expression of this personality disorder. So why aren't female psychopaths as easy to spot as male psychopaths? According to researchers Gakona, Kunicliffe, and Smith, Malignant hysteria, also known as histrionic personality disorder that we spoke of earlier, is at the heart 
of the female psychopath. They go on to say, quote, Psychopathic women lack men's grandiose self-structure and are not immune from experiencing themselves as damaged. They need others, but it's pseudo-dependency and maladaptive neediness. They need those others to bolster their own self-esteem and obtain some sense of stability with their own troubling affect. As we said before, this description fits Diane Downs to a T. The characteristics of that type of personality, which are attention-seeking, promiscuous, dependent, and inability to form stable and lasting relationships, even with her own children, one has to wonder if they had Diane Downs in mind when they came to that conclusion from their research. Diane maintained her innocence throughout the trial, manipulated the press, and basked in the national attention she received, again trumpeting her narcissistic personality. And for Diane, bad attention really is as good as good attention. She acted the role of a suffering mother and even became pregnant before the trial, some people believe, to gain the jury's sympathy. She committed these crimes because the man she wanted did not want children. And for Diane, their loss was a small price to pay for her happiness. I found the testimony of the prosecution psychiatrist especially convincing. He also determined that Diane fit the profile of malignant hysteria psychopathy. He noted, quote, Diane shows no remorse. She regards the children with no empathy and as objects or possessions. Feelings she has for them are superficial and only extend to how they are a part of her. And that brings us back to Diane's foray into surrogacy. The doctors were worried that Diane would not be able to give up the baby, but she insisted she was not interested in keeping the child. Diane craved the attention the pregnancy afforded her, and a child would just steal that attention. After Diane and Steve were officially divorced, she moved from one lover to the next. Quote, I love them all. I just don't go to bed with people. I love them. I don't think it was so much that Diane loved them. The fact that they wanted to bed her fed into her narcissism. Look at me. I'm so desirable. All these men want me. Although she told psychologists later that she detested sex, Diane liked the power she had over men, as well as the financial relief it might provide. She would borrow money from them and then move on. Despite her failing the psychological testing, in 1981, Diane became a surrogate. And although she had a job delivering mail for the post office, she did not have money to provide childcare all the time. And she was not taking care of her children. And the children, especially Cheryl, would be locked out of the house, hungry and alone. A neighbor noticed this and confronted Diane. Did Diane change and take better care of her kids? No, she turned on Cheryl. Quote, you're such a bad little girl. If you don't obey mommy, you deserve to be killed. The neighbor went on to say that the children were, quote, emotionally starved. An echo of Diane's own experience in childhood. 
Diane was blind to her children's health and emotional struggles. She believed her parenting was perfect. And even though her physical abuse of them increased, she described her relationship with her children as the Four Musketeers. Diane's pregnancy was almost at full term when she was interviewed by the Washington Post for her surrogacy. Diane was excited by her newfound fame, which painted her a kind and generous woman giving the ultimate gift. And on May 7th, 1982, she delivered a healthy baby girl. After the baby was born, Diane became very sexually active and aggressive. She now had a habit of scratching her partner so hard during sex that she drew blood. Some of her partners became afraid of her, and that just made Diane laugh. And then there was Nick, the man that Diane had finally set her sights on for good. But after a brief affair, Nick stopped taking Diane's calls. But Diane would not take no for an answer. She believed she was giving up everything for Nick, and he was not appreciating it. Diane attempted suicide, or at least she thought about it. When Steve, who was visiting at her house, heard a shot in the bathroom, he pushed his way in. According to him, Diane was sitting on the tub and pointing a gun at him as the door opened. Don't worry, she told Steve, I can't kill myself, but I can kill you. Diane did not follow through on that threat, but she would soon do something much more tragic. Diane was still obsessed with Nick And despite his constant rejections and coldness, she was determined to get him back. And nothing, not even her children, could stand in her way. Apparently, prison was not going to get in Diane's way either. After she was incarcerated, Diane attempted multiple escapes one that was successful enough to give her 10 days of freedom before she was captured and returned to prison. The Oregonian newspaper reported on a letter that Diane sent to the Oregon Parole Board in 2008. The handwritten 12-page plea attempted to assure the parole board her escape attempts were actually a very good sign in regards to her ability to reform. Quote, of all the felonies on the law books, escape from prison is the only one that indicates a healthy attitude about society. If you truly want to know what sort of prisoner won't come back to prison, your first clue is the prisoner who thinks more about being on the outside of this place than being well-programmed or adjusted here. Wow. I'm going to have to push back on Diane's definition of a healthy attitude about society. I'm certain that the majority of prisoners think a lot about being out. And I would know I've interviewed a lot of people that committed murder in prison. And if Diane had a healthy attitude about anything, she would not have committed those heinous crimes to begin with. Like any narcissist, Diane felt completely justified in her actions. But that's at the heart of any narcissistic behavior. Whatever they say and whatever they do is okay because they came up with it. The most important person in a narcissist's life is the person looking back at them from a mirror. And that person is perfect. (music) 
Diane Downs' trial began on May 8, 1984, and lasted six weeks. Diane shocked everyone by appearing at opening arguments seven months pregnant. She refused to say who the father was, but stated that he was, quote, attractive and did not want the child. The trial was filled with shocking moments, including Diane mouthing the words to the song Hungry Like the Wolf when it was played in court, and she was moving to the beat. Just as shocking, the defense attorney accused the police of planting the bullets in her apartment, and he did so without any evidence of that whatsoever. But the most powerful moment in the trial happened when Diane's daughter, Christy, took the stand. When asked who shot her, the girl replied simply, my mom. Christy testified that her mother stopped the car in the middle of the road, got out and took something out of the trunk, walked back to the car, reached inside the car and shot her brother, her sister, and her. After 36 hours of deliberation, the jury found Diane guilty of all charges. But the conviction did not stop Diane's dating life. A month later, she announced that she and the imprisoned I-5 killer Randy Woodfield, were engaged to be married. The two of them met through letter writing and did so two to three times a week. But six days later, on July 30th, 1984, Diane told the papers that she was not marrying him. It seems that Randy had announced he was marrying someone And Diane simply thought he meant her. Of course she did. This is narcissism on parade. In August, Diane gave birth to another daughter. The child was taken by the state and adopted. Later that same month, Diane was sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years at the Oregon Women's Correctional Facility in Salem. And in 1985, Diane's parental rights were severed. Steve officially relinquished his rights as well. The next year, Fred Hughey, the district attorney who tried Diane's case, adopted Christy and Danny, which is at least a happy ending. As we mentioned earlier, one of Diane's many escape attempts enabled her to have 10 days of freedom. During that time, Diane ended up staying with one of her fellow prisoners' husbands. I bet you can guess how that friendship fared when Diane was returned to prison. Reportedly, as she was about to be apprehended, Diane grabbed a BB gun and attempted to commit suicide by cop, but then changed her mind and surrendered peacefully. For her escape attempt, Diane was sentenced to five more years in prison. Diane insisted that she had only escaped in order to locate the bushy-haired man, but out of concern, for her children's safety, she was transferred to a prison in New Jersey. According to the state law she was sentenced under, Diane is entitled to parole hearings every two years, starting in 2008. She has been denied every time. Diane was transferred to Valley State Prison in Chowchilla, California in 2010. She continues to proclaim her innocence. 
According to a 2008 article in the Oregon News, there was a psychological evaluation done on Diane that year that confirmed her previous diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. The evaluation went on to say that during the 20 years Diane has served of her life sentence, she has not done any self-reflection or seemed to have learned anything about herself. Quote, regardless of guilt or innocence, one normally would be asking the how and why questions of life. The thing that is most troubling regarding Ms. Downs is that she appears to have done very little of this. And I doubt she ever will. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Director of Research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Supervising audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Editorial support, Alexander McCall. Post support from Allison Sandler. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, producer is Stephanie Wachneen. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Fort Media.